The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. Come check out these two boards. They are the same 555 timer circuit with the same rated components in each. The timing capacitors have the same capacitance and voltage rating. The only difference is their case sizes. I'm using a 1206 and an 0201, yet the circuits are blinking at different rates. To explain why, we have a lot to cover. So just as a reminder before we get started, if you head over to element14.com, you can find show notes with more information about what's going on in these circuits and a quiz to test your knowledge. Recently, I had the opportunity to speak with Yang Jiang from Murata about using smaller capacitors in electronic designs. We talked about the trends driving the need for smaller capacitors and how going smaller can affect supply chain availability. Then we talked about the design considerations and the tools available to help select the right capacitor, especially when downsizing a design. That conversation is when I got the idea for the 555 timer board. I wanted to see if I could demonstrate the effect that causes the capacitance value to change. And I wanted to see if my super advanced reflow oven could solder tiny capacitors. Before we get to why the flashing rate is different, let's review a couple of basics on ceramic capacitors. Multi-layer ceramic capacitors are stacked layers of dielectric material with alternating electrodes. Each sandwich is a tiny capacitor where the dielectric thickness determines the capacitance. By stacking more layers, we get more capacitance. An O201's capacitor has a length of about 0.2 inches and a width of about 0.1 inches. The length determines the maximum height as well because if the capacitor gets too tall, the chip could fall over during pick and place. Another consideration is the temperature coefficient. Ceramics have coefficients like C0G, X7R, and X5R. These digits determine how much the capacitance varies across temperature. An X5R's range is negative 55 degrees C to plus 85 degrees C with a variation of plus or minus 15%. Hint, it is rarely plus. While X7R's go to 125 degrees C with the same 15% variation. The last point is the main reason for this difference in flashing rate. Ceramic capacitors also have a voltage coefficient or DC bias effect. As you apply a voltage to a ceramic capacitor, its capacitance changes. Higher DC voltages cause the capacitor to effectively lose capacitance. Turns out the thinner the dielectric layer, the more loss that DC voltage can cause. Since the rated voltage, temperature coefficient, and package size affect the dielectric layer's thickness, the voltage coefficient varies for different package sizes. So even though our 555 timers both had 10 volt, one microfarad capacitors, the 0201's DC bias effect was more pronounced than the 1206. That is why the 0201 lost more capacitance and blinked at a different rate. While the temperature coefficient is well documented, the voltage coefficient is not always easy to find. However, looking at Murata's data sheets, they do include it for their parts. So for this 0201 capacitor, you can see that as the applied DC voltage reaches 10 volts, the effective capacitance drops all the way down to 200 nanofarads. Now, before you go and get the wrong idea, all class two and three ceramics have a similar phenomenon. It isn't just Murata capacitors. But with all of these aspects that change a capacitor's effective capacitance, Murata is different in the tools that they provide. Next, let's check out something they call SimSurfing. SimSurfing is a design tool that covers many of Murata's parts. I'm not going to go in depth into how it works because Murata has some good videos on how to use it. But keep in mind that what this tool allows us to do is search for parts, see specs, apply temperature and voltage conditions, and then see how various parameters change. Let's go check it out. Starting with the parameter section, it narrows down what parts are available if you aren't sure. In our case, I have the exact part numbers I want to use. 
Starting with the 1206, the first thing to notice is that it has an NRND tag. This means it is not recommended for new designs. By the way, Young and I discussed whether or not Murata will continue to produce larger case sizes in our Element 14 interview. He did show us a trend how people are moving towards smaller case sizes, so their production capability is also going to follow that curve, which is why some parts like this one are going to have a not intended for new design tag associated with them. With a part selected, we can open various graphs with characteristics versus frequency like impedance, ESR, and capacitance. Now in my 555 circuit, frequency matters, but it isn't critical. If you're selecting output caps for a switching power supply, you'll definitely want to see how the impedance changes across frequency. After all, above the self-resonant frequency, you don't really have a capacitor anymore, do you? For our case, we're interested in the detailed capacitance versus DC bias graph. The graph here is not much different than what we saw in the data sheet. But if I enable multiple graphs and then add an 85 degree C temperature, now we can start to see how the capacitance changes with applied voltage and with a change in ambient temperature. Tools like SimSurfing are the extended data sheets you need for selecting passive components. Now, let's go grab the DMM and compare how good simulation is to some actual measurements. So at really low frequency, the measurements did not agree with SimSurfing at all. But I think that has more to do with the 555 timer itself. And so I decided to adjust the circuit to increase the frequency to about 160 Hertz. On SimSurfing, I plotted the 1206 and 021 capacitors that we are using. By the way, this is when I noticed that my 1206s are actually X7R. I thought both capacitors were X5R. So they are slightly different in terms of temperature coefficient. However, when you see the final results, I don't think that the difference would affect them enough that I need to redo any of the measurements. At 5 volts, we should get about 0.399 microfarads on the 0201 and just over one microfarad on the 1206. At eight volts, the effective capacitance of the O201 is only 0.226 microfarads, while the 1206 did change slightly to go just under one microfarad. Using these numbers and the resistor values that I picked, I calculated the expected frequencies. At five volts, I measured 160 hertz for the 1206 and 245 hertz for the O201. And then I increased the circuit's VCC to 8 volts. Now the 1206 measures 159 hertz and the 0201 is up to 326 hertz. Now comparing all of the results, notice that the simulated values are a little bit different from the measured values. In fact, this data shows that the SimSurfing tool is being conservative. Plus, we're not being super precise with our measurements here. So let's focus on the relative change. The 1206 barely changed, while the 0201 experienced about a 35% decrease in capacitance, which caused the frequency to go faster. Now, let me address a couple of points that people brought up when I showed them these results. The first was that I calculated the frequency with the nominal resistor values, which is true, but I did use 1% resistors, so they should be pretty close to nominal. Next, what about the tolerance affecting the initial capacitance value? Again, that's true. The 1206 has a tighter tolerance, so it should have been closer to nominal. But here's the thing. The fact that changing the DC voltage causes the frequency to change so much clearly shows the DC bias effect. So I think the frequency we calculated for this circuit is pretty close to what we should have expected. It should have been closer to 160 Hertz. It's the change from five volts to eight volts that really matters. So a couple of things to take away from this video is first, do not be afraid of physically handling an O201. Even with my super advanced reflow oven and basic tools, I was able to get them to work. And as the trend for smaller capacitors continue, consider the impact of transitioning to O201s. It isn't just a matter of changing footprints, and it isn't just O201s. As you downsize ceramics to 805, to 0603, or 0402, you still have to consider the effect of capacitance. Look to a supplier like Murata who provides detailed data sheets and more importantly, interactive tools so you can understand how their components will work in your circuit. 
I have no doubt you might have questions about this video. The best place to ask them is over on the Element 14 community. While you are there, you can check out the show notes for links related to capacitors, a link to the interview with Yang Jiang from Murata, and a link to a quiz we wrote to help test your knowledge. For now, thank you for watching another episode. It's time for me to get back to barely finding O201s around my electronics workbench.